there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chrysanthi Tan, you can call me Xanthi, and today's episode is based on minutes 141 through 145 of Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. This is it, everyone. These are the final moments leading into the credits. This includes Luke fully evaporating into the Force, Rey and Leia exchanging words about the future of the Rebellion, uh, we have Kylo Ren, he's leading the First Order Troopers, and Rey shuts herself off from Kylo for one last time. This is also where we get the little coda with the broom boy before the credits, showing the stable hand kids on Canto Bite reenacting the story of Luke Skywalker. And then, of course, my favorite moment of any Star Wars film, which is the moment we the credits eclipse, it, we eclipse into the credits, I guess is how you say that. Um, that's my favorite part of Star Wars films. And I'm very lucky today to have Lorenz Gama as my guest, um, an absolutely incredible violinist who played on The Last Jedi score and numerous other uh, scores, Star Wars and otherwise. We're going to get his perspective on the music here. Hi, Lorenz. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. The luck is all mine to be here and to have been a part of these scores and these scoring sessions, which were one of a kind. Uh before, I would love to know like what your history is with Star Wars. Like, have you seen all the movies? I have not. And you know, it's a, it's very interesting. I, as you can probably hear, I did not grow up in America. I'm Swiss and in Switzerland. Uh, so I grew up in the seventies and eighties. I guess that's when I was a child and then a, a, a youngster and which are, I think, prime Star Wars years. But uh, I and my friends, we were thoroughly oblivious or mostly oblivious to these movies. And so my history with the, with these films is very, I'm almost a tabula rasa in a way. But then I started to record some of these, I guess, these last three or at least the last two. Um, and then I vowed to myself, I will now watch these movies. So I started and I started at the very beginning can you remind me when the first one came out? 1977? Very... 77. Okay, good. So I started watching and I, I immediately got lost, uh, <laughs> as I always tend in, in films anyway, even in the simplest of films. And, uh, and to the present day, I have not completed my homework, but maybe being part of your show uh, gets me to finally resume the work on that. This is fascinating. So you're kind of going at it from the uh, like you worked on it first. So you're gonna you're yeah, you, you have the inside out, and most of us have the outside trying to figure out what happens on the inside. I guess so. Yeah, that that sounds about right. Yeah. So I know that like I've looked at your credits. You've also done um, like you did Solo and Rogue One as well. Which okay. You, you might not even remember because you've done so many films, but you've done four Star Wars films. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I thought it's two. Okay. All right. I guess it was four. <laughs> See, it's such a big jumble. The story is so complex and so enormous. And I think it would take a pandemic to actually, <laughs> and you know, maybe I missed my That's chance. Not... No, no, you, you I, did I... it. It's never too late. It's maybe never too late. Okay. Maybe there will be another pandemic. Hopefully not. <laughs> but this is actually, this is interesting though, because while you have done four Star Wars films, You've only done two that are John Williams. So the other two were not John Williams. So that might be where the confusion lies. One of them was Giacchino and one of them was John Powell. Okay. Two other very eminent composers, but of course, you know, working on a score of John Williams and with John Williams is so overtowering work for anyone else. I must really? say it, it, uh, that's why maybe these other two have just temporarily <laughs> gone into the gray matter in my brain, um, from which they can be, of course, retrieved any time. And I'm sure they were absolutely excellent scores as well. So what's the difference? Because you've worked for, like, you know, all the main major players, I guess, who are doing all the big Hollywood film scores. What's the difference between John Williams and these other also really prominent people? Yeah, it's, um, well... How can I summarize it? It, it? it, Maybe that's why we reserved an hour today to talk about his music. 
because it, it cannot be put that simply in a sentence or two, but, but I'll just start somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference of being in a room with John Williams playing his music and someone else is, maybe I could say foremost, it's the one of an incredible expectation that when I go to a recording studio with other composers, it's not quite as heightened the sense of expectation as it is with Maestro John. Um, and I think it goes in every way. We as musicians, probably the movie going crowd, have an unbelievable expectation when they go see a Star Wars movie. And we as musicians have an incredible expectation when we open the score and we see the melodies, the rhythms, the harmonies uh, there in front of us on the page. And I think it's uh, John Williams who has an incredible expectation of us musicians. Um, so so that this, this sense of expectation is absolutely palpable and I know all of my colleagues would agree it's, it's higher than ever when it's about work with John Williams. Does it live up to the expectation though? I feel it like- It always does. Oh, okay. It, it always does and it always exceeds it, at least for me. So now I cannot- Erica said the same thing, to be fair. Erica Duke Kirk Kirkpatrick, who you, um, everyone might, might remember from episode one, the cellist, she said the same thing. Okay, all right, interesting. Um, my own personal expectations get exceeded every time I work with John Williams. And I think the expectations are, are obvious. We, we expect something incredibly masterfully done artistic, crafty, like nothing else, something on a high level of just of craft, of, of compositional craft, but also musical inspiration. Um, and yet I'm always surprised that I didn't expect it to be that intricate and that amazing in, in, in detail. I think it's, it, there's so much detail in his music. Of course, I think when you're maybe not a musician, you don't react necessarily to the detail or you don't see the detail, just like I'm not a painter and I don't necessarily see the detail of a painting as maybe an expert would, but I react to it. And um, so as a musician playing in one of John Williams' scores, I'm in the middle of the score and I sense the detail around me in instrumentation, in, in notation, in how the themes develop and, and, and the textures. It's not just themes that everybody can hum along, which are also famous uh, by now, but it's, it's way more than, than that. It's, it's the detail that goes into all the textures of the music. And that is just amazing with John Williams. I think the, the like painting analogy is a good one because if the melody that people hum is like say the general shape of you know a, a painting or you know a figure in the painting the details might be like the different types of brush strokes used right. that still you right. can see the same painting vaguely if you like step back and if right. you don't notice you know the different types of strokes but it does make the experience a lot a lot richer. I wonder what leads to, I wonder um, why that is. Um, I do know that he's one of the few composers, I don't know, probably the only working composer, film composer I know of who writes everything out by hand. Um, mm, interesting. Yeah. Like, yeah, so he but never. Of course, when we, when we play, when we have our cues, which are the sheets of music in front of us, it's of course all printed. Of course, it's, it's it goes all... to someone and... else who puts it in the computer. <laughs> right, right, right. But you're saying when he's at the piano, I assume he probably composes at the piano a lot. And then it's all first handwritten. Right? Yes. So mm -hmm. actually, I think um, Brian Johnson was saying that when he went to John Williams, like he went to John Williams's house and on his bookshelf, he has like, he's been doing it the same way for decades. Like each score is just, Pencil, is pencil and paper on the same with the same pencil with the same paper and it's all like a bound like manuscript book and he could see on the shelf like et jaws like just uh, the different handwritten 
books for like each of the films. Um, right. I, I wonder how thick these <laughs> these books are because the the size of these films, I mean, most of his movies, I, I don't think he has ever written a score to a small film or, right. or not a small score to, to even a medium sized film. But I think the scores are always enormously elaborate. Yes. And he had a year to write this one, An which is a year. lot more than most people yeah. get. Yeah. But when you're John Williams, you can request that. Sure. And I think the, so it goes hand in hand and it's then the delivery of something that is worth waiting for a year, you know, which then warrants again the next year that's being spent on something else. I mean, it's uh, John Williams is, I think quality of, above anything else is really what defines him. And it's quality of the experience ultimately of the moviegoer, but the quality of every brush stroke, if you want, or pencil, pencil stroke, I'm sure is there from the beginning to the end. So as a violinist, what are some of the like compositionally and in terms of like when you get your part to look at how is the writing tangibly different for you like I'll give you an example of something that I'm thinking about is one thing is like if something has been written on a computer or you know I can tell that it's been written on a synthesizer and then assigned to the strings there's like a certain writing style to it where it's like maybe feels blocky or, you know, I always say that like, even if something is played by an orchestra or even if it's the best sample string sample library, a lot of the times when I listen to strings in films, it still sounds like piano to me. It still sounds like yeah. um, a certain, a certain type of, of writing that's not native to maybe the string instrument. Um, or, or maybe there might be like certain string crossings or some really awkward things that, maybe work better <laughs> on the piano right. or, um, so yeah, right. what are some? Right. And, and, and oh, sorry for interrupt. No. Um, I think every, every composer struggles with what works for a certain instrument, what doesn't work for another instrument. And that's when orchestrators come in. Now, some composers are orchestrators in their own rights and know this intimately well, what works on a violin, what doesn't work you know, what type of, like you say, string crossings, especially, do you want an arpeggiation to have a repeated top note or not a repeated top note? Does it go da, 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 or does it go da, 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 One is more liquid than the other. You would need to be probably a string player to know these things, or you can study this, you know, very religiously. And you can be advised by orchestrators and by string players and the same for wind players, the same for pianists and so on. So I myself don't know how John Williams works, whether he, he knows every instrument. He orchestrates most of it okay. himself. So you, you, <laughs> Which is very... you know, that, that, that actually was a question I always had, and I'm, I'm glad you can answer that. And, and that just right there, that puts him even higher on a pedestal for me, because not only the creation of the music, the sounds, but then the nitty gritty of what works for each individual instrument. And if you look at a score, I mean, if we had a score in front of us, it would be 30, 40, 50 lines, individual lines that all work together at the same time. And knowing that each line will work at all time for every instrumentalist, uh, that is just another dimension of work, just the amount of work to figure that out. Now, other composers, of course, they don't do that work. They they do a score at the on the keyboard and heaven forbid, MIDI samples. And then here's the tempo. Let's just press in quarter note equal sixty and see if it works. Yep, it sounds pretty good on a on a computer. So let's have the musicians play it this way. And then you figure out what actually doesn't work and what does work. So that there's a whole palette of of composers. Everybody works different, and um, but I guess you're asking what is the difference. So there's a difference right there. Well, the first that, I will say the first one that you yeah. mentioned was the arpeggios. So I'll just play like what Lawrence is talking about is 
like an arpeggio is a broken chord, so you could have like. And so that this might be a common thing that you might want to write in a score. On a, on a violin, this is pretty awkward. It's less awkward though if you know to like. You know, there are there are just different ways of sort of writing the the same thing or a very similar thing, but just um, making it more, you know, native or easier to play on a particular or you know just more natural on a particular right. instrument. Exactly. And for example, if you repeated that top note on the violin, then it would work on the violin and then it wouldn't work on the piano. Like mm. who would want to lift that, True. that like pinky? <laughs> that would not work very well, probably on the piano, while on the violin it worked. <laughs> so it does take a lot of instrumentation uh, study to present to the orchestra a score and the individual parts that are perfectly just played. But, um, you know, it's okay when occasionally a composer other than John Williams comes in and that some stuff has to be readjusted and there's usually plenty of orchestrators in the room who can quickly adjust these things and then one goes to a different queue while things are being fixed in another queue. But that very, very rarely happens with John Williams because the the homework is done so meticulously well by him. And I, 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 I do know, I'm sure he has a, a lot of helpers who just make the parts. I mean, making orchestra parts is, it's a huge job too. Absolutely. I have a concrete question about, um, in this set of minutes, um, you know, sort of the end of the film going into the credits. So the end we hear like the force theme, do, 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 you know, played really softly on the trumpet. And then, as is pretty standard in a Star Wars film, um, the string section comes in and then it, you know, suddenly gets very loud and it crescendos into the credits. And I'm curious if when recording that cue, like, you know, if you remember that cue, that cue or, or other ones like it, are you playing all the dynamics live, like pretty much how we hear it? Or is that all like mixed afterward? You know, that is a very good question. And actually, incidentally, I just watched those five minutes literally half an hour ago, right before I, I joined you in this call. And I was wondering the same thing myself. For a moment, literally at that moment, I thought it sounded like somebody was switching, the, I mean, was moving the dial up. It didn't quite sound like the most organic, natural, crescendo that happens in an orchestra it's a it's a it's a different thing but most of the dynamics are absolutely part of the score and sometimes the dynamics are what are being worked on the most really uh, what do you mean yes, like in as, rehearsal yes especially with john williams it's not an exaggeration to say that sometimes we would play a cue 10 12 14 times with hardly any talk we just do it again and we do it again and every time it gets better and better and it becomes more organic and then maybe after four or five times maybe john williams or somebody else says let's bring the second clarinet down a notch let's bring the outside celli up a notch and overall the strings a tiny bit lower and then things start to get adjusted but it's, it's, it's very refreshing how often we just played a few times, many, many times. It can take an entire hour to record a three, four minute cue. And we played over and over and over until it feels natural to everybody, to the musicians, to the conductor, who is always John Williams himself, standing there for up to six hours a day, seven hours a day in his 80s. And, uh, and without the slightest moment of fatigue or anything. So anyway, you asked me at the beginning, what's different about John Williams? You can see everything is different. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm touching on all these random things, but they're all, I think what make John Williams a, a miracle worker in a way. Um, so these dynamics to get back to that question are definitely being worked on in the orchestra the pianissimos, the softest, softest fadings away of things and, and loud surges and, and bombastic 
you know, war themes and these are all happening in the room. It's just that interesting in those five minutes that you mentioned. It was maybe d dialed up a little bit more, you know. It yeah. seemed to me slightly artificial, yes. Yeah, which well, it makes sense given that it's the end of the film. They probably wanted to get it perfect and, uh, and right. emphasize that. And by the way, I could be wrong. It's just an inkling I had. And it's interesting that you mentioned this very moment where this theme comes in. It's very, very subtle by the trumpet, I think he said. And then the strings. Yeah. And there's a surge that, that's very noticeable. And it's, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to read you a quote that John Williams has said about your orchestra or, you know, the recording orchestra that you played in. And maybe you can corroborate some of what he said. Um, so this, is, this comes from an interview with Jim Shveda on Classical KUSC a few years ago. And most of the interview is about The Last Jedi soundtrack. So he talks in the interview about, um, well, first they talk at length about how, like there's a whole good seven minutes of the whole half hour interview where they talk, just talk about how like wonderful the orchestra is. And I do bring that up because, you know, when the scores were announced that they're going to be recorded in LA, a lot of people were like, oh, we're not gonna have the London, we're not gonna have the LSO, we're not gonna have the London Symphony Orchestra. I'm like they're probably trying to save money by coming to LA or, or whatever the reasons are and sort of making assumptions that the LA Orchestra is not as good as London. You know, just people who mostly don't really have much of a basis for saying that, but you know. Um, mm. And so I found this interview where John Williams talks about his experience working with you. And he says, they say that, first of all, it's the top notch best, best experience. And um, he says that he wishes you could get out of the studio. He said, you know, the orchestra is virtuoso level, I've often felt that it'd be fun to do some concerts with that orchestra to get them out of the studio environment and let us play something more than a five minute cue or a three minute cue or a seven minute cue, whatever. And then he said, toward the end, we did a recording, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, he said, I don't know the people personally. I don't know how they gain ent entry into the orchestra as an audition system. I don't know even all the years I've been through this, but they come to this work at such a high level with such great training and discipline it's a joy i cannot ever wait to be with them again for the next one yeah that's that's very it's uh it's touching and it's also very refreshing that that somebody of his stature and 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 celebrity status actually thinks about about the musicians who are sitting in the orchestra for whom it's it's work of course and it's you know, everybody in LA and, and everywhere else in the world is, is glad to have the work. But it's also, it's always an honor for us to play his music. So it's nice to hear that it goes both ways, which I guess are the best relationships in a way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I assume um, that he must have many friends, musician friends in LA, because that's, I believe, this is where he lives. He lives there now. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would probably also enjoy recording music in the town where I live rather than having to fly to London, which is not Absolutely. around the corner Absolutely. from LA. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, it sounds wonderful what he says. And I'm actually very appreciative of that. And then he, they go on to speculate. Um, <laughs> he said, it's a different mentality in LA said, of course, you know, it's highly competitive. They don't have a comfortable tenure that orchestra members have and deserve, he said. The major orchestra is another. And he said, so there's a pressure on them to perform constantly and at their peak. Um, and then I wish I could tell you how they've achieved this level of ensemble playing because they're playing for different conductors every day with different kinds of repertoire and different demands being made on them. And then, which I, I you know, is very accurate to Los Angeles yes. studio musicians. Yes, but it's it's. I think it's actually very accurate of any musician in the world, and, and, and even orchestra musicians uh, who have a tenured job. Yes, they have maybe the job security, but there's also a different conductor actually coming in every week, That's except the, the principal, uh, the, you know, the music director, who who these days, I don't know how many weeks, 
uh, he actually sees his orchestra, it might be as few as 10 weeks a year. And then all the other 40 or 30 weeks are actually being spent with one guest conductor after another. And the repertoire, if you have to play, in the, whether it's in the LA Phil or in the LSO or anywhere else, Boston, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, or in Zurich or in Beijing, the, the amount of music that just gets put in front of you week after week is really enormous. And it, it, it's not just the case for us studio musicians, actually. You're very humble. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and then the last thing, and I think this speaks to what you were saying before, John Williams said, I find that it takes about an hour to tune it, not intonation wise, but as an ensemble. I try to pick a couple um, cues and he doesn't even take takes the first hour. He said, I just take a few cues and we play. They get used yep. to who their stand partner is, who they may not have sat with for three or four weeks. And um, right. yeah, and then he talks it's about Again, it. Again, yeah. so different, so different with John Williams than any other composer. It's That's exactly what he does and we feel it. it. We don't know exactly which take is going to be used. So we just play, we record, we play. It always gets recorded. And we just play it again and again. And I always get this feeling, this is just to get to know the music and the room and the feel of it all. And of course, this might be now a segue to talk into this famous um, part of his uh, recording technique, which is that he does not do it with a click track. Right. M most of his music is done just with him in the room, looking at the picture and trying to line it up the best he can in the moment. And that maybe that's why it sometimes takes 10, 12, 14 times until he's pleased. And he's, uh, speaking of humble, he's much more humble than I am. He always asks uh, the people in the booth, do you think that was good enough? I'm not sure. <laughs> and then we'll just do it again. And and it's it's truly refreshing that the, the work of art is being done in the moment. And it, it's a living, breathing thing. Just like the thing next door, which is one of my dogs. Can I quickly Absolutely. go quieter? <laughs> Absolutely. So while he's doing that, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the minutes you know, and, and what's happening actually in these minutes so that he can jump in when he joins. So, oh, he's back. Good, I am back. Awesome. Um, so we were talking about the, the absence of a click track, which is in, in a good 90% of his music. Oh, yeah, I think, oh, I, I think to remember that once we had a hard time lining something up, which, which means we follow him conducting and he lines it up as he conducts because he watches the scenes change and he tries to move the orchestra along or slow them down when he kind of feels it's about to, the scene change is about to happen. And I think we had trouble getting it right. And then he said, okay, let's try it with the click track. And we did. And we did it a couple of times and then he said, no, off, goodbye, click track. And then we did it again yeah. without it. And it was much better in the end. It took work, um, but right. it was so worth it. So his music is, it, it lives, it breathes. I mean, you can tell when you listen to it. It's, of course, a highly, always a highly romantic score. Yes. He subscribes <laughs> himself to the romantic tradition, which means music has to have an ebb and a flow. It's not a machine. It's, it lives. And, uh, and his music, I think, is more flexible than maybe any other. Yes, flexible is a good, flexible is yeah. a good word for that. Yeah. Yeah. It, actually, and in these in these minutes, like at the beginning of these minutes, we see Luke Skywalker has finally become one with the Force and, you know, his we get this beautiful shot of his cloak is flying away. And here we get a very this this strikes me as a very um romantic, not 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 necessarily romantic because I, now that I think about it, it reminds me also of like Bach and it reminds me of a long history of composers but let me just um i'm going to play that what's going on there and pay attention to the bass line
descending, just <laughs> descending all the way down. Right. Uh, Bach was the master of descending bass lines. And, and I think bass lines, there's something about the bass line descending that opens up a score because very often we also feel that a ascending um, vocal line, usually in the top, is also opening up, aggrandizing mm. the experience of music. So nothing better than an ascending melody line when there's a descending bass line because the two of them go very well together. That's a that's a good point. And the force theme like does that hugely. Like it's like that's huge. Especially compared to like Kylo Ren's theme, which would be like or descending, basically. Go in the opposite direction. Yeah, it's interesting how, how descending melodies have this sort of gnarliness about them that there's something of course um well it, it gets compressed it doesn't have an elevating sort of experience and and i'm sure there's plenty of descending melodies in, in john williams's music too because the music is not all about elevation there's a lot of oh absolutely angst and fear and all that in there a lot of like static ones too but if you think of like the light side themes and like yoda and even rose which is it mm -hmm. that also has a sort of upward mm -hmm. Lyd lydian feel to it mm -hmm. um but yeah a lot of the evil characters get descending <laughs> <laughs> which is where they belong <laughs> The, oh, and I also, I'll also say the descending bass line is often associated with like laments, passacaglias. We also hear it in a lot of the pre in the prequels. We hear it in like episode one with Duel of the Fates. Um, it also is reminiscent of the Dies Irae, which we've talked about numerous times. Um, so yes, highly recommend. Um, re-listening to this scene and paying attention to the bass line, which just, I don't know, it just beautifully floats away into the next thing. So, Lawrence, I have some questions for you from, uh, from Twitter, from people who were curious about a couple things. We've already covered some of it. Like, was people really want to know what the difference in the process was compared to other movies, which you did discuss. Um, what was the most challenging thing to play in this score or the most challenging aspect in this particular score yeah if you remember yeah yeah well i i don't <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember this particular score that well and uh, remind me which year this was 2017. Okay. i actually remember when you were recording this score because you and erica kept disappearing <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully only temporarily. Well, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> but yes. it must have only been a week or so, maybe two. <laughs> um, yeah, as musicians, we sometimes disappear for various reasons. Um, do I remember the score? I don't think I remember it that well. But, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge about John Williams's music is that it's really difficult to play. It's uh, now some some of it is very melodious and kind of grand and moves at a moderate speed, and that's all doable. And then there is there are intricate uh, parts in the score where things just move very very fast, very hectic, due mm. to of course the film, mm -hmm. whether it's. Uh, you know, um, um, airplanes chasing each other. So you mostly they're, action. They're cues. probably not called airplanes. That's in like Star Wars. <laughs> flying things. <laughs> flying so things, exactly. Chasing each other. You mean mostly other. like action, action sequences. Good. Thank you for this. <laughs> That's the word I was looking for. Okay. Of course, in action sequences, then, you know, again, his craft is so highly developed that the individual parts are just really difficult Hard. to play. They're just hard. 
I very... think about that too. And I, I, I remember an anecdote about John Williams, which a friend of mine told me, and as with all anecdotes, I don't know if it's true, but it's, it makes for a good story, uh, which is maybe probably his hardest score I imagine. Um, and, and I played some of those music several times and recorded some of it too, was um, Harry Potter. There's a lot of wizardry happening in those movies and the, the music is of course reflecting that. It's a very lively score. Um, so anyway, at some point, I think the composer asked the concert master, can you play this? And the concert master played it and um, he said, okay, I'll, I'll write something a little harder. Then he wrote something harder and the <laughs> played it and said, okay, well, let me try something even more difficult. And then finally the concert master said, okay, I cannot play this anyway. He says, that's what I would like. And that's what, oh my God. what stayed in the score. And it's, but you know, it does not necessarily actually have to be played perfectly. I mean, some of these things, it's what he wanted. And this is what the story really illustrates is a wash of sound where actually the individual inaccuracies of, of an entire army of string players, if you combine it all together, it makes for this texture that's wild and is supposed to sound a little chaotic. And uh, if you make it sound good, then actually a, a little bit of, of inaccuracy is actually a desired effect. Um, and again, in painting, I'm sure that there are analogies where not, where it's it's the general, general sort of tapestry of, of the individual thousands of brush strokes is what gives the effect rather than the perfection of each individual one. I'm so glad you mentioned that. That's an, uh, a really, really good point because, well, I do know from like orchestral playing as well that if you just look at your part and try to play and try to learn every single section perfectly, you might focus on the parts that end up not being as important like you might practice right. under practice some parts but you didn't realize that they were very exposed and had more of a you know maybe it's like octaves and like that actually does really have to be perfect sure. um and then some other parts where maybe you end up then when you when you play it, you end up playing it too i don't know too stridently or too mm -hmm. you end up overplaying it and miss, right. miss and missing the effect of it and like missing the i don't know other aspects of it and that's sort of an issue that I hear a lot in um, scores or in just in music that are virtual instruments completely is if now, if it's too perfect, I can tell that it's fake because mm, right. it's, it's terrible. the normal variations that occur, even just like from having different instruments or just like the tiny, tiniest, tiniest intonation things. Like there's just not as much of the texture, even if, you know, mm -hmm. In a mm -hmm. real orchestra, we would think this is in tune, but then when you compare it to like just playing perfect computer sounds, that right. just sounds like a whole different level of like, then you're missing a different element. You're, if, and I notice that like when harmonics, and I notice it sometimes in the tuning of like chromatic lines when they're done on a computer, sometimes it's like mm -hmm. the intonation is like just intonation, like, or sort of like equal temperament. And so you don't, sure. sometimes the like chromatic, sometimes the half steps are like really big or, yeah. or just misses misses tension because it's it's too it's it's too sterile, and uh, and each individual note does not have any meaning anymore when it when they all look like eggs, or they all sound like the way eggs look. Um, all right, so I I think that the magic word here is patina, Pat, or I think in English you say patina. Oh, patina. Okay. Patina, which is a very interesting um concept which is the the grime of time that overcomes in a way or, or comes over an artwork and gets polished away and then there's more dirt and it gets cleaned away and after a while for example on the violin on the varnish that is called patina so after 300 years of polishing a violin and putting dirty fingers on it, ideally not too dirty but but, uh, you know, it's perspiration and it's dust and it's rosin dust and 
and you you clean that away and together with the cleaning product it makes patina and that's why a 300 year old uh, piece of furniture that has been varnished and cleaned for so many years gets a completely different shine uh, than something that comes fresh out of a factory. Oh, so I think John word. Williams, yeah, patina, John Williams' music has patina on it because I think he goes to the limits, especially in those tricky passages. He, he, he goes almost over the top with how difficult some of the lines are. But again, especially in the string, in the string sections, and I'm just one of many violinists in that string section. If everybody tries their hardest and is a professional, which we all are, then the end result is this sort of shimmery patina over the whole thing, and which makes his music sound so alive and so real and not like a machine. Yes. Oh, my gosh. This actually reminds me of another question, and we sort of talked about this earlier, but what would you... Com what am I trying to say? Okay. What other composers does it feel like to rehearse or perform when you're recording with John Williams? You know, like some passage you might think, oh, this you know, reminds me of my Prokofiev of something, or, sure. you know? Yeah. Yeah. There, there, I, I think there's no composer who has not learned from other composers. I think they would be silly not to because there's such a wealth of of um, of artistry in previous centuries um, that the scores are right there. They're even, you don't even these days have to go to a library. You can just study them off online. True, uh, but I think it's harder to do that now because there's so many things that it's hard to know what to focus on. Like it's just a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Now there's so much that there's almost nothing because <laughs> there's no direction. Yeah. For, it's harder to find direction. But All I right. Do so I, I think it's it's it's. I mean, I I I don't want to pretend that I can give any advice to composers these days. But maybe just this one piece, which is you should be true to yourself, and uh, and find out who you are, and then you can maybe learn from composers who resonate with you, rather than trying to learn from everybody. Now, John Williams certainly has learned. From his inspirations, it's so obvious, it's not even funny. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're very, I think that the the uh, inspirations are very obvious. It's, it goes as, probably as far back as Wagner. And uh, I think his movie scores are like Wagner operas. The, he dramatizes music. I mean, for example, this five minute clip that, that, you, um, that you're using today, I think the first minute of it that doesn't even have any dialogue at all. It's just music. And there's acting, there's some facial expressions. But the music, the, the amount of of scene changes that the music goes through in just the first 90 seconds is just breathtaking. And it it's like an opera. And who is the greatest opera composer of all time? Of course, it's Wagner. Whether he was a nice person is another matter. <laughs> but he certainly he he revolutionized opera and he was probably the most important musician in the 19th century anyway so, so that's for, for those who don't his... know wagner is is credited with sort of starting the whole leitmotivic um sort of i don't know now it's sort of a trend but the yeah the idea right. of inst instilling characters and themes with leitmotifs and sort of developing them over the course of a long scale of a large scale work Right, and uh, and and many other things uh, that make Wagner truly special, and um, his the scope of his operas is enormous. And there's an opera where it takes about five hours to play Tristan and Isolde, just maybe six hours if you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you count in pee pee breaks. Uh, which both the orchestra and the audience and probably the singers too need. <laughs> and in those six hours, there is not one perfect authentic cadence until the very end. When oh my Isolde gosh. When has died of love. I mean, it, it's, I, I think romanticism 
taken to an absolute extreme and, and just the, the scope of the scores and 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 philosophically and and, and um anyway in, enough about Wagner. wait wait that's what you okay you brought up something that came up in the in the last episode the perfect authentic cadence so in the last episode i i sort of i sort of skipped over it but i did mention that it was interesting that we suddenly like it took me by surprise watching it because i i don't feel like we get it that much in John Williams scores either. I mean, compared to right. how much we normally hear them, like in other kinds of music, but we did hear this like very, like, I don't know, it was like, like it was a very, it was a, it's called a perfect authentic cadence and it's sort of very final sounding. And right. um, it's interesting that you brought that up as it took, you know, Wagner prolonged, his perfect authentic cadence in that opera for so long and sort of in John William, I mean, and at least in star Wars scores, they're a little, they're kind of few and far between only reserved for very sure. um, special final moments. Um, sure. Exactly. So many cues don't end on a, on a cadence at all. And they get linked together and together. To the together. next it's cue, a, to the next cue. Right. It's a through composed score that is really, on the level of a of a major musical work uh, of, of that sort of complexity and, and never ending, in a way. And um, now th 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 that's another thing about Wagner: the idea of the never ending melody. There, there's in in Lohengrin there is a melody that's four and a half minutes long, and that is just the melody and of course the, the opera is again it's hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. uh, but one melody that the soprano sings from the beginning until she is done and then hands her melody over uh, to the next character is four and a half minutes and now you go and try and write something like that it's, it's not so easy and that's just the melody and then you have to fill it out with drama and story and plot and and then you have to write the libretto of your Wagner, and then you have to find the funds <laughs> to build your own opera house uh, because yes. uh, you have you have enraged half of Europe with your uh, antics, political antics, and you've taken away everybody's wives. Oh gosh! Uh, especially your. your we're talking about Wagner, person. not John Williams, by the way. <laughs> yes, we're talking about Wagner. <laughs> yeah. um, and and anyway, so yeah, being Wagner, I think was 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 quite complex and. So, but but musically speaking, what Wagner did in his operas, I think that is certainly, well, it influenced the entire 19th century and well into the 20th century. And John Williams is no stranger to these ideas of absolutely ep epicism and never ending musical materials that just keeps evolving and evolving and evolving. And, and, and the complexity of the score, the power of the score. So that's, that's certainly an influence. And then Richard Strauss, I hear a lot of Strauss, mm -hmm. late romanticism in John Williams' scores and Prokofiev and Stravinsky and, and of course, cool stuff. Holds. Okay, a little, a little challenge. If people mm -hmm. enjoy the scores of Star Wars and asked you, Lawrence, can you recommend me several pieces to look up say I don't know anything about classical music don't know where to look if if you say like late Brahms or late or like do you have any specific starting points of at least you know say five or so pieces that I might also like mm -hmm. like I'd say Enjoy. Mars the planets might be one. Oh, from the planets of, of Gustav Holtz mm -hmm. yes sure right um you mean specifically for John Williams' music, where he's sort of nodding at other composers, yeah. or, or just generally, for example, Wagner, I don't think John Williams ever quoted him. I don't think he quotes him. I think he's it. more so influenced by him. It, it, he is, and, and I think one should listen to some Wagner. Okay. Uh, it's, well, The Flying Dutchman, I think, is his first opera where he just pulls out all the stops and just listen to the overture of Flying Dutchman and before you do, just listen to some music that has been composed up to that moment. And then listen to the Flying Dutchman and see what 
overdrive that is and what it's it's a high octane sort of gasoline that was suddenly pushed into the music that had not been there before with all the beethoven and you know schubert and that's all amazingly powerful music that had been composed up to that point and then came the earliest romantics mendelssohn schumann uh chopin were all born around 1810 and then a only about a decade later came Wagner and he was not a child prodigy, prodigy, but when he suddenly had the epiphany and he wrote the Flying Dutchman, he, I don't know how, what came over him, but he revolutionized music right there. And you should listen definitely to the Flying Dutchman, at least the overture or the entire two and a half hour long opera. It's, it's, it is not a waste of time. It's, it's an amazing wild ride literally um so that that was that that would be a top recommendation uh for sure cool and maybe strauss something by strauss also very epic music like to loyan spiegel or yep that's kind of a fun score okay. um I'll, i'm i'm gonna put links to all of these i'll till Anspiegel is good or you know why not the alpine symphony Mm, okay. Where he, you know, Richard Strauss was the ultimate or one of the ultimate programmatic composers. In other words, music not just for music's sake, but music that has an actual program other than the music itself. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's a great. That's a great thing. So, if um, for those listening who would like to get more into classical music, programmatic music, like romantic programmatic music, is sort of like film a film score without a film, well, you know, it, it's sort right. of like there are stories that go along with the music. So like the music tells a story. So something like Strauss, um, like he's saying is it's very, there's a lot of character and there's a lot of like transitions and you can just imagine that there's something else going on. Like you can imagine like Fantasia, the film, like you can imagine that something, it, you know, it's, and also I'd say like Berlioz symphony fantastique is, would be another example of, mm -hmm. of romantic programmatic music. That exactly. tells a story. Exactly. And the, for example, the Alpine Symphony is about a hike. It's hiking up to the top of a mountain in the Alps. And the music is, it's huge. It's just like nature itself. It's uh, infinitely varied and luscious. And, and finally, the music reaches the zenith, the top of the mountain, and it's Pianissimo. Very quiet. Oh, it's that's... very quiet. It's the opposite of what everybody expects because the music builds up to this tremendous high point. But then you're on top of the mountain, there's nobody around, just a little breeze. You're selling and, me on it. I, see, and I'm maybe not... a, a bird that comes and sees if the hiker has maybe a morsel of food from it. And you can literally just hear the wind and and that's what Richard Strauss writes in his music. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to listening to that. And as someone who, you know, I spend hours every week uh, on small portions of the Star Wars scores, um, I've come to really appreciate moments that subvert my expectations with dynamics and um, and also with the sound design, pulling things out. Last Jedi has, I mean, I don't know if you know, but Last Jedi has some very surprising sound design moments where there's a lot of space that you don't expect. There's a lot of play with silence and um, uh, playing around with space in, in, ways like, in ways like that with both the score and the, um, and the sound design. So right. before we wrap up, I, I, I want to ask you, did you know that they made a score-only version of this? A score only version, version of the meaning. film. So you can watch this film without any dialogue, without any sound effects, with just the score. The entire thing. Yes, the entire film. And I imagine it must be fabulous. Yes. Uh, now, you cannot say that necessarily about every film score, and that is not because those other film composers aren't any good. They're excellent, and so many of them are so fabulous. But it's this kind of film that is, it's a little bit like a, a rich wine, which complements a rich meal. You cannot have a rich wine 
with a light fish, mm. all right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, or a light wine with a, with a lamb shank, that doesn't work. So the, I think the, the richness of the score is perfectly suited for the richness of these films, which mm. touch on huge subjects of, of humankind. I, that much I do know. And, uh, and with I'm themes the spanning expert, nine films. There you go. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I think Star Wars and, and probably actually every film that John Williams worked on with, well, with Steven Spielberg, really. They, mm -hmm. they are, That's of definitely course, great collaborations. And there. That, those are collaborations. And I think one complements the other for sure. And uh, it's amazing great. to see that. I have to say it is amazing to see that 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 such such art actually works where where it's collaboration of various kinds of art. There's acting, there's directing, there's the visual effects, there's like you say sound effects, and there's the music, there's plot, there's they all work together and make this rich meal, I guess. I so agree. It's all it's awe inspiring to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for for coming on today. Your insight oh, you're is very fabulous. Welcome. You're very welcome. Um, listeners, the motifs from this set of five minutes were in order. The force, Kylo Ren's aggressive motif, Kylo Ren's hesitant motif. We heard Poe's motif. We hear Ray's theme mixed with the force theme. We hear the rebel fanfare. We hear the main Star Wars. We hear the main theme when the kids are playing and we hear it in the chillest. Um, it's very magical. Um, then we hear the force theme again. And then we get to the credits, and we hear the main theme, and then Leia. No, we don't hear Leia yet. We hear Rose's theme. So in these five minutes, all of those uh, motifs we touch upon. And if you're following along on the soundtrack, this is the track called Peace and Purpose, and also the beginning of the finale. Ooh, that's all I have for today. We have, there's, a, I think, two more episodes left in this season. Um, all credits from here on out. Um, Thank you so much for sticking with me on this whole journey of The Last Jedi. Um, if you're listening as a podcast, this will be available with captions on YouTube as well. And that's, that's all I have for today. Do you have any parting words, Lawrence? No, I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, you know, to tell you the truth, I didn't know if I would be an expert <laughs> of John Williams's music. I think he's the only expert at it. So this is just my humble view on how oh. I've experienced his music. And uh, I hope it's, it's worth something to somebody. Oh, absolutely. Um, each person's unique experience is just, I treasure it so much. Everyone mm. has their own, is going to have their own. There should be there shouldn't be just one definitive expert because everyone has their own lens. Um, right, right. So I very appreciate it. And also, by the way, everyone, Lawrence was my violin teacher. So um, there I, you go. I, yes, I have a great deal of respect for you. And um, very proud violin teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank anyway, you. I will see you all next week on Star Wars Music Minute. <laughs>